Um, so just to welcome Polly Arnold from um, Berkeley. Um, Polly has a joint appointment. Um, she's got um, a faculty professor in chemistry and uh, she is the chemical science division director for Berkeley Labs. Um, and she's going to talk to us about F block catalysts. Um, just a quick point of housekeeping your mics are off, so you won't be able to talk. If you've got any questions, please use the QA. We'll have some time for questions at the end, so please hold your questions towards the end. I think Polly's going to talk for about 45 50 minutes, just so we don't lose track of the questions and not answer your question. Um, if there's anything else you want to say to us, any technical difficulties, if you want to introduce yourselves, please use the chat function. And with that and a very warm welcome, I'll hand over to Polly. Thanks very much, Josie. Um, I hope you'll tell me if uh, I lose sound at any point um, or if I get uh, competed by the bin men who collect the rubbish at this time of day in Berkeley. Uh, I have no control over uh, even the, the language that they use when they collect the rubbish. Um, so thanks for inviting me to Palatus Hub to come and talk to you about some of the work we've been doing. I'm going to give you two topics that we've been working on and they arise from our work looking at F-block chemistry in general, organometallic F-block chemistry, um, towards starting with small molecule activation, always with an eye on whether we can develop catalytic procedures as a result. And so the reason that we're interested in, um, in organometallics of the four Fs, here and the five Fs here is because um, we don't understand enough about their fundamental structure and bonding. And by making weird molecules, we get a chance to remove these metals from their traditional environments and put them into positions where we might be able to generate more unusual electronic structures, or we might be able to isolate them from the traditional rusting decomposition routes it allows us to know precisely exactly what oxidation state they're in, how many protons there are around, that sort of thing. The difficulties arise in uh, understanding this is if you just dissolve them up in, uh, in water or whatever, um, we don't, they're so paramagnetic almost entirely that it's very difficult to keep track by conventional mechanisms. And we don't really understand um, enough about um, what, what their spectroscopy look like. So we like, like to make, try and, to try and make simple, well-controlled complexes. And I'll show you the progress that we've been making on this. So your traditional view of a lanthanide, as you should just control with my cursor so they can scan it. Hold on a minute, there we go. Uh, so, if you put a lanthanide in water, you get an uh, eight or a nine coordinate aqua solvated trication. Um, and there's, not a, there's a, a lot of ligands you can put around the outside, but not a huge amount of control that you might get for a substrate to access the metal. If you want to do catalysis with a lanthanide though, there are many opportunities that you could get going. So they have fantastic Lewis acidity and they're tunable by size, right? So you can move down group three for the rare earths and then all the way across the four Fs here. Uh, tuning as you go to get your combination of size and Lewis acidity. And the other thing that we don't often talk about is that they're not actually very toxic by ingestion. So you would have to eat six times more cerium chloride than iron chloride if you want to kill your rats, um, which I'm hoping you wouldn't, of course. Now, if we go to the, the 5F, things get more complicated. So we generally think of the 4Fs as almost exclusively in the plus three oxidation state, with a few exceptions when you can stabilize the half shell or the full shell or the empty shell of electron configuration. But because actinides have very strong relativistic effects, they start to use combinations of Ds and F orbitals and, uh, to make hybrid orbitals. And now we really struggle to understand their structure and bonding. So we can then go through all of these formal oxidation states just for uranium, which is here, underneath chromium and molybdenum um, and tungsten in the periodic table. So vastly different to neodymium plus three. Um, and this becomes uh, interesting. We start to get geometric control when we can get multiple bonding. To, and this is where we get covalent bonding to the actinides in these formation of strong oxos. And then single electron chemistry takes us all the way through these oxidation states to the most recently isolated and previously textbooks would tell us that you couldn't uh, isolate formal uranium plus two in this rather beautiful, unusual 
this aryan structure here and so we have a lot more to explore to understand the chemistry of these and redox confounds what we think we know about these systems all the time so a lot of work going on in this area all right and so the way we do this is we take a, a large blue circle of organometallic junk of shrubbery and we put it around the surrounds of the metal we block out fast equatorial ligand substitution at uranium or we block out the fast water exchange reactions here so that we can start get access to a single substrate control of one single substrate to the metal um, and the other thing the organometallic ligand does is it solubilizes the metal um, into organic solvents and it compatibilizes this with the small organic molecules that we want to look at and now we have control we can start to really pick apart the orbitals that are being used in the bonding understand the proportion of 5f character that these different metals are using for it and how that changes with oxidation state and how it continues to confuse us and how we can then enhance and use the electronic and the magnetic properties of these interesting metals to maybe do something technological as well but i won't be going into that today because today's about catalysis so this is one of my first uh, favorite reactions from a really very long time ago when patricia watson used this bulky bis-cyclopentadienyl ligand set around the smaller of the rare earths. Um, she made this methyl complex here, so this is plus three oxidation state, lutetium or scandium, and this was the first organometallic molecule to uh, function on it, to activate methane, which is a phenomenally cool reaction. Very strong, very symmetrical bonds in methane, and it goes through this four-centered transition state, which is a sigma bond metathesis, where you can exchange, essentially, this H plus is swapping between two carbon minuses that are sat in the equatorial plane of orbitals of the rare earth. And so you can do, um, Tilly managed to convert this into a small yield of difficult silylation chemistry. So you could silylate methane catalytically with this, with 10 turnovers. But generally, this is most useful for isotope exchange. This is still of interest to the geoscientists as well, looking at rare earth minerals and uh, how you might get isotopic change in uh, contact with. Um, fossil fuels uh, in the ground and how that is affected. So a really beautiful reaction here, um, but no further functionalization unless you can really push that. And then if you think about what we can achieve with uh, subtle uh, ligand control, uh, here's a recent example from our labs, collaboration with Jason Love, where we use this one minus ligand to almost completely block the equatorial plane of the uranar system here. Uh, this uranyl dication here, which is the group oxidation state for uranium with very strong bonds. And we found that both removing the remaining anion and adding a Lewis acid here to this oxo uh, gave us sufficient control over the um, reducing power, the redox oxidation states, uh, uh, the former redox potential of the oxidation state, that we can now convert uranium-6 to uranium-4 with hydrogen. So the reductant hydrogen, which is one of the radiolysis products of water, suddenly becomes relevant. Organometallic chemistry suddenly starts to fit into the realm of things that we thought we were just doing to, to challenge the textbooks, basically. So I'm sorry if you can hear the bin men outside right now. Okay, so thinking about the small molecules that we might like to bind to these metals, um, the first example I can show you again is methane. Right, so here we have these relatively strong bonds, but symmetrical and difficult to access selectively, of course, is the reason that we want to study these. Um, there are a range of hydrocarbons we would like to functionalize rather than burn. And then N2 is a classic molecule whose subtle binding uh, helps us understand orbital use in these metals if we can start to see binding. And it's taught us a huge amount of fundamental d orbital theory by making these complexes, uh, making organometallic aryan complex is taught as a huge amount in the 80s about fundamental structure and bonding. And this number here, I should tell, this is actually a red herring because the 2% of the world energy use um, is actually to make the hydrogen that converts the hydrogen to ammonia. Uh, and I think Google beats us uh, storing all our Zoom lectures on the 2% number anyway now. Okay, and so these are the oxygenates and I want to show a bit of chemistry of these two as well. So these are um, Interesting small molecules, again, like carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, interesting molecules to bind to metals to understand the, the orbitals they're using and the structure and bonding. And then we have molecules that we would really like to be able to convert uh, into a uh, future palette of renewable feedstocks. So we'd like to move away from converting these hydrocarbons into this uh, famously evil molecule, carbon dioxide here. 
and start in using these as our future feedstocks. We already use millions of tons of carbon dioxide in insertion chemistry. Um, we'd like to be able to you know, really rely on all of these. And there are green ways to make epoxides increasingly at the moment. Okay, so these are the two very simple coordination, low coordinate organometallic style complexes that we've been making. They've been, we've been used to use them as starter materials. They've both been around since the 1980s. Um, and so here we have lanthanide three, and here we have actinide plus three. So this is free uranium. So thorium generally fits the group oxidation state plus four. So we look at this with uranium. And these are interesting uh, because we can make them on a 20 gram scale. Um, they're uh, in the absence of air and water. They're very stable. Uh, they have very strong metal oxygen bonds and they have these interesting pyramidal structures, which is already telling us there's something we don't understand about which orbitals they're using for bonding and whether there are effects of these weak interactions from uh, CH groups from the ligands that point over the top of the pyramids when they make the structures. They're highly paramagnetic. They stack beautifully in the solid state. And we can tune them both sterically and also electronically if we just go for the power groups. So, so these aryl oxides are really very nice. And we've been spending a lot of time working on the fundamental structure and bonding looking at these. I want to talk to you about how we've been developing catalysis by thinking about what we learn from their basic structures and their basic reactivity. And I'm going to start by talking about cerium trisaryl oxide and its catalysis. Right. So cerium does go to cerium-4 where it reaches group oxidation state. So you can do a cerium-3, cerium-4 couple. That's usually stoichiometric in organic chemistry. Um, but here we're actually using it because it is a basement. It, it's, it's really earth abundant. It's more common than, um, um, than copper or iodine in the periodic table. Uh, sorry, not copper, more copper common than nickel or iodine. And um, as I said, uh, we can therefore call it earth abundant. Um, and if we want to get chemistry out of this and the others, we're not going to rely on this redox couple. What we're going to do is just swap out a T butyl group for a functional group. And uh, what we're now thinking about is whether there are catalyses we can develop that rely on the fact that because we have so many orbitals and hybrids of orbitals we can use, we can get rapid ligand exchange of the substrate at these Lewis acidic metal centers. Right? So here's the functional group we're putting in. This is an n heterocyclic carbene, an NHC, and it's a strong nucleophile. So it's a really good ligand for late transition metals, but it's a poor ligand for these rare earths right? because these are uh, uh, forming very strong bonds to these oxophilic. Uh, they're oxophilic and they're forming very strong metal oxygen bonds, but these donors are not so good. And the reason that we like these as well is for a long time now, we've known that they do nucleophilic catalysis in their own right. So here, this is a reversible activation rather than a catalytic reaction, but this is the NHC reacting with CO2 as a nucleophile in the same way that an amine would, but this is a reversible if you get your alkyl groups right, your RL groups correct on the NHC. Right. So this is the molecule we made. We've been spending a long time previously working with um, flexible backbones here, but this is the molecule system that we've really hit on recently that's giving us really great control. Uh, we've finally managed to find a ligand that's big enough and sturdy enough that we can start to look at the weak hemi labar binding of this NHC group to the cerium and how we can get that to, to give us reactivity. It's a modification of a ligand prep by Wang. It's a fairly straightforward synthesis. We could do protonolysis or salt elimination reactions to get to this. And we made a series of rare earth complexes of these. And again, we've done a bit of tuning of these R groups to allow us to look at the uh, NHC mobility. Uh, if you look at the crystal structure, just like the more flexible compounds that we've been making for a decade or so, maybe longer, um, it forms this T-shape, this Mer configuration, and we assume that this is sterics, this is the isopropyl compound. And as it rotates gently, you can see we've got uh, carbenes that are cis and trans to each other. Um, and because of this rapid ligand exchange, we're not yet thinking about which ligand it is that is low bar. We're assuming that we have an opportunity for rapid ligand rearrangements to happen in solution because we're not constrained by d orbital configuration. So, right. And so the first reaction that, we, uh, uh, that we're interested by here is carbon dioxide, although we've looked at a lot of heteroar ligands as well. So this is CO2 inserting formally into the cerium carbene bond. And we see under one atmosphere of pressure, we get three insertions into each cerium carbene bond. 
and this strong cerium aryl oxide bond remains intact. So this is the opposite way around you would see if you compared this to a palladium compound or a platinum compound. And it kind of interestingly, although probably irrelevant, is the fact that we've now gone C3 symmetric. So this rotating on the right hand side here is the stri crystal structure of the triply inserted CO2 complex. So I think that the fact that it's three C C3 symmetric is irrelevant for the further reactivity, but it's nice to see that we have this structure because now we have delta and lambda isomers. And we've used that for controlling polymerization stereochemistry in the past. Um, so this might be something that we can look at further later on. What's interesting though is I'm glad we did the methyl, ethyl, butyl, futile study where we went, uh, the poor students spent a lot of time making the different derivatives of this because if we'd stopped at the isopropyl, we would have found no further reactivity in this system. But if we use the mesotile compounds, actually exactly in the same way as Louis found, we actually get a reversible reaction. So the mesotile group on the carbene here gives us a reversible reactivity of the CO2. And this is the only compound that is catalytically active. So this does uh, a reaction, this catalyzes the reaction of CO2 with an epoxide, extremely poorly, I have to admit, very low yield um, and very slowly for the formation of cyclic carbonates. But we haven't optimized this. We were just pleased to see that we would be able to uh, activate the CO2 and then trap it onto somewhere else. We could go off and we could add co-catalysts as you would normally expect with a co um, and carry on with this chemistry. But what we've actually done is then switch to looking at other substrates. Right. So now we have this carbene hemilability. We can start to bring in and activate other monomers. So the CO2 was good, but actually we're interested in lactide. We've been working with lactide for many years. And I was interested in this because this is a single component bifunctional system. So here we have the rare earth lanthanide here, and now we have this NHC uh, nucleophile in combination. And we know the hemilability, we understand that now, and we can think about chemistry that we could do to ring open lactide and get a polymerization. So this is a, a nice monomer. Um, it's renewable, it comes from cornstarch, it's biodegradable, it's biocompatible, so you can make sutures and things with it. Um, and it's normally digested into the form uh, of rat lactide, which is the one-to-one -one mixture of D and L. And we've had some success in the past of separately polymerizing the L and the D into two isospecific chains. And then of course these two chiral chains can wrap around each other uh, and form a helix, which is called stereocomplex. And we get uh, improved um, thermo, um, thermo and mechanical properties as a result of that. So we get a much higher anticipate, much higher 50 degree higher melting point than you could get from just polymerizing these together on their own. Um, but in this case, what we're interested by is whether we can use a single component um, catalyst to can you hear me still okay? Um, whether we can use a single component catalyst to make cyclics. So the traditional way of making, uh, um, of making uh, lactide into a polymer is to add uh, an initiating group so that you have a polymer can insert and, am I supposed to be reading the chat at this point? Okay. Um, Leo so Montecat. I'm sorry? I'm on to the chat and the sound is good. Okay, fine, good. All right. No, I, I, it's funny with that feedback, isn't it? This is not like teaching. Um, and so here we get these terminated chains from the initiator coming in. Right. So um, the plan here for our bifunctional catalyst is eventually uh, my mouse will work and I'll be able to show you what we think should happen is that we should be able to uh, displace the NHC, the lactide should be able to come in and bind to the Lewis acid, activate it, and then the NHC that is pendant should be able to come in and ring open at the, at the lactide that's at this point, whereas we wouldn't have that control in this system. So eventually when my mouse works, I will shuffle through probably the next seven slides. I apologize for this.
Okay, that seems to be better. Um, so without the co-initiator, we should be able to keep on ring opening this monomer into making large ma macrocycles, right? instead of having a terminated polymer in the system. Right? So here are the results that we get from this. So normally, we would expect to get heterotactic polymer if that was the nice one. So that would be alternating D and L in this. So what the first thing that you can see is that Sterium L3 compound here is extremely fast. This is 15 seconds, and we're getting relatively reasonable control over the polymerization, pretty fast turnover frequency as a result. But if we go to a much lower loadings of cerium catalyst, we now get fantastically uh, high turnover frequency. This is really exceptional, this 270,000, um, and extremely good control of the polymer, relatively good control over the dispersity. We would like this to be one, 1.1 1 .1 would be great. This is not too bad at all, um, and uh, pretty high, um, extremely high, actually, molecular weights for these compounds. So we're pretty happy with that. Um, we're getting uh, generally good heterotacticity, um, but what's really interesting um, is that if we move to the saturated analog of the system, so if we go from instead of having unsaturated backbones here, we get to a, a, um, a saturated, saturated CH2CH2 backbone on here, we now get order, orders of magnitude nearly in four times higher turnover frequency. So we have sorry, three times higher frequency than we would have had for the unsaturated carbene under the, um, the exactly the same conditions here. So it's producing cyclic polylactide instead of the standard linear with high molar mass, uh, mass is dependent on catalyst loading, um, and around 250 kilograms per mole. So these are really high, large macrocycles. And so we think that the saturated NHC is showing higher rates because the labile NHC uh, is allowing faster insertion kinetics. Um, so, because these are macrocycles, they're kind of different uh, to, and harder to characterize than the standard linear polymers. So, we're using a combination of GPC, intrinsic viscosity measurements, which are important, um, NMR spectroscopy, spectroscopy to look for the presence or absence of um, end groups, and also moldy mass spec so that we can look at these macrocycles. Um, so, what we notice is that we should expect uh, cyclic polylactide samples should have lower intrinsic viscosity than linear polylactide. And this is because the macrocycles have a smaller hydrodynamic radius compared to the linear channels. So this is what we think the mechanism is, and we're building on the work by Hedrick and Weymouth by suggesting this. So it's not, it's not particularly new. What's nice about this system is that it's so fast, um, we can use such low catalyst loading, we get good control, and that we're making really large, really heavy macrocycles. So we think the carbine comes off, um, and inserts into the activated lactide, and then we get this Zwitter ion formation where we can then do further insertions. Right? So because we're not using a co-initiator, eventually this will backbite and we lose these macrocycles, they fall off, and then we have a true catalyst rather than, than an initiating system. And so we can have a look at this uh, in comparison to just what we is essentially the carbine on its own. So we protect the oxygen here, and we can add, now do these comparisons. So relatively high catalyst loading, we still get reasonable polymer formation from just the carbine on its own. But when we go to the conditions that we were getting really great activity from the cerium compound, we're not seeing this anymore. So this is just not as good as having the combination of the Lewis acid and also the NHC in there. Um, I should also say that um, if we add three equivalents of isopropanol to this compound, to either the cerium compound or its saturated analog, we switch to the formation of linear polymer, and we can see the end groups in shorter chains by NMR spectroscopy. Um, it's slower, but at the same sort of catalyst to monomer ratio, the 500, the 5,000 equivalents, we're still making polymer with 126 kilograms per mole and slightly lower dispersity, slightly better dispersities than we were seeing here, so around 1.4. So that's good. If we compare this with the literature, we can see that. Um, Krischeldorf has really got some fantastic tin-4 catalysts for doing this chemistry. Um, although these are generally slower catalysts, um, they, uh, they can um, make pretty good polymer um, with lower molecular weights than what we're seeing. Uh, similarly, with the uh, lanthanide uh, trisporyl hydride, which Fanny Bonnet's group were looking at, similar um, uh, smaller macrocycles than they're making. And then this was really the, the original system that kicked off the work in the system where they have wonderful control of the polymerization, really great control of the 
fast catalysis by just using simple NHC on its own. So this is Hedrick and Weymouth's work uh, from about 10 years ago. And this is what they're suggesting. So you see we can, uh, we're completely standing on the shoulders of giants in suggesting this mechanism. Um, and there, they did a, some beautiful mechanistic work to show that the importance in these systems is that you get fast propagation. Um, and so your macrocycle can grow so long as your propagation rate, your insertion into this growing, chain, growing cycle is fast. Mm -hmm. um, so why are we interested in these macrocycles? Um, because since the 60s, when it was first suggested that cyclic structures might be possible from zwitterionic polymerizations, um, it's been suggested that they should have interesting properties. Um, and we're beginning to see evidence of this. So Krischeldorf's polymers give an unexpectedly high melting point. So this is 20 degrees higher than we would expect from a normal linear polymer, although it required some processing. Um, and now what we're seeing is that with um, much heavier macrocycles than previously, and also the fact that when we polymerize L-lactide on its own, we don't see a polymerization. We're hoping that this will give us a chance to really explore these properties. Um, so we have control now over all three properties, uh, selectivity, uh, control, uh, molar mass. So we should be able to make um, lots of cyclic polylactic acid um, and study its properties alone, and also as an additive in linear lactide, where it's been suggested that uh, it shows faster crystallite nucleation, higher crystallinity, and it should have enhanced thermal stability and, of course, lower intrinsic viscosity than the linear uh, lactide. These are quite remarkable considering the such tiny differences between these, uh, the, the linear and the macrocycle. So we're hoping to be able to study that much more easily now we have access to these large macrocycles that aren't limited by what was presumably an entropic problem uh, in giving the lower systems. Right. So I want to switch gears for the second half um, and talk about uranium. So if you remember, I talked about the differences between the actinides uh, and why we might want to study them. It's much harder to work out the D in the versus F orbital fundamental structure. Um, and we also have these oxidation states to worry about. So here is the traditional oxidation state, one electron redox that lots of people have been studying in recent years to show us a lot of small molecule activation that helps us understand structure and bonding, and also whether we can get some interesting further reactivity attributes. So these uranium-3 compounds are actually not the thermodynamically stable state, and they're much uh, in anaerobic conditions. Everything is always driving towards uranium-4 and uranium-3. So they really are very strong reductants, uh, is similar sort of um, uh, potentials uh, as samarium bisamide for those of you who've worked with uh, that in organic chemistry perhaps. Okay, so this is how we make them. We're copying Sattelberger's Jacks prep, uh, where we're starting from a uranium-3, another pyramid, um, whose structure we don't quite yet understand, um, um, but a really beautiful molecule made by um, Dick Anderson in the 70s. And so this is uranium with three silyl amides in it, and this is a protonolysis reaction. So you're uh, losing an amine, three amines from this, um, and we expect to form this. And this is a beautiful dark green crystalline material that's air sensitive, but there's a strong reductant. What's interesting to us, though, um, is the fact that Sattelberger made this under argon. Um, if we'd made this under nitrogen, um, he would have found that. Um, this is not an, an innocent, this is not an inert solvent um, a substrate. And in fact, you can make N2 compounds of this. This would have been the first N2 compound by at least a decade for an actinide or for any F block, in fact. Um, so that would have been a really cool system. But they were doing fantastic other chemistry with it. And this was times when it was really difficult to, to study these molecules. It was very difficult to do crystallography. Um, and uh, NMR spectroscopy was. Uh, difficult on these strongly paramagnetically shifted molecules. So this is what happens if you make it under N2. Uh, it's difficult to see, so you still make the same bulk dark green crystalline material, but if you take the no, notice that the supernatant is red, you can actually fish out a second compound. So this is not a very stable compound, but it is reducing N2. So the NN bond length is slightly increased compared to free nitrogen, so this is looking more like uranium-4 having reduced N2 by two electrons in the system. So this is the crystal structure we group. It's much easier to get crystals of the tris-aryl oxide here um, and quite difficult to get crystals of this N2. 
but we were pretty pleased to have done this. And it turns out that, you remember I was saying that we can do electronic tuning at the power positions here? We can actually do this, and we've spent quite some time doing this now, just swapping out, messing around with the power position here, because we can buy most of these phenols, and then making a siloxide. And here is an order now of these simple, big, monoanionic ligands binding to uranium, and dramatically increasing the reduction capacity and the binding strength of the N2 that we end up with the result. So you can see the N2 distances are not really very helpful in showing us how reduced they are because this siloxide compound here on the right, we have to boil this in toluene before it will react with an atmosphere of carbon dioxide above it. So you would assume that that is a really tightly bound um, N2. Um, but what we're actually finding is that it's the Raman stretches that give us a much better uh, sense of what's going on and how, how much we're weakening the N2. And look at this fantastically shifted nitrogen NMR shift for this paramagnetic compound. Okay. So, um, in fact, when we get to the T-butyl compound, it's impossible to isolate um, the N2-free compound. Uh, if there's any trace nitrogen dissolved in your solvent, you always end up picking up the N2. So these molecules are actually much better at binding N2 than we would have considered before. Um, and it, of course, it made us think about whether we could do anything with this. Um, Freisuk has already shown us, after uh, fantastic uh, work on reducing N2 compounds with group five, that uh, you really actually need three electron reduction into your N2 before you can usually get further chemistry. And in this system, he's absolutely right as well. So, all these formally doubly reduced N2 compounds, if we just treat them with potassium as strong reductant or a range of others. Unfortunately, the thing that made life so easy for us at the beginning, these big monoanionic ligands, means that we end up just getting ligand rearrangement, like I mentioned for the F block, and uh, some junk. Um, and so X is siloxide or araloxide um, in these systems. Um, so if we take a step back and we think, okay, maybe we've learned all we can from the big monoanion ligands, maybe we need to go a bit further. So if I show you um, the chemistry that's been going on in understanding small molecule activation chemistry and getting further chemistry out of these from the F block, it's all been two electron chemistry and it's all been coming from two separate metals coming together to bind. So this is the active site of the cerium oxidant uh, in solution. So this is the cerium three, cerium four couple in real life, always going by two electron chemistry. And then there's a huge amount of work been going on recently into coupling CO. So instead of inserting CO, these molecules uh, do one electron chemistry and reduce it and make these iron dilate tank complexes. Um, and these are fun because they're um, making CC bonds very easily from a homologation, but they're never going to be catalytic. Uh, I shouldn't say never, but um, going back from uranium-4 to uranium-3 is extremely difficult. So these have been great fun to study, but we've never tried to make anything catalytic from this because we would need to use potassium to get back. And what's the point of doing a CO coupling reaction with potassium and then adding in uranium because it's so, uh, it's not really an ideal catalysis, is it? Right, but if we look at all of these molecules that have been now shown to bind N2, uh, reduce arenes, uh, pick up charcogenides and make interesting versions of them, and also generate further CC coupling from CO2 and CS2, you can see that they all require two metals. And in fact, here, this is complicated to draw, but in fact, this is still two uraniums. This is beautiful chemistry by Mazanti's group a couple of years ago, where they pick up N2 and then they can do further chemistry. So they can protonate, so they pick up N2 across this uranium nitride, and they can protonate this reduced nitrogen because it's reduced by uh, more than two electrons and get ammonia out of this system. So 70% yield of ammonia from this chemistry. So we know that making two metals together is a, a, probably a worthwhile pursuit in starting to control what the chemistry we get out of this. All right, so we progressed um, um, uh, a few years ago from just looking at these simple compounds to devising these ligands, which are, um, these have been well used in the literature because they're beautifully easy to make. You can make them from co-condensation reaction between the dialdehyde from whatever this platform in the middle is here and then the phenol and so you just do that up for three hours with the Lewis acid catalyst and you end up with these compounds that look as though they ought to be able to combine two metals. We actually started working with these 15 years ago but I didn't have the self-confidence to keep going because we 
just couldn't understand their, their spectroscopy because sometimes when you get the electron count wrong, they go um, NMR silent and they were too difficult to look at. But we've overcome that by just starting from the uranium-4 systems. So this has been a really difficult set of uh, work for the group to do, and I'm really proud of them for fighting through this, because this looks simple on paper, but it's actually a lot more complicated than you would think. So instead of starting from uranium-3, what we're now doing is going back to uranium-4, which is the thermodynamically more stable compound. And we can do the same chemistry here that we do with also with thorium-4, which is, again, the group oxidation state and really stable compounds. So you think that this is boring, right? Because uranium-4 and thorium-4 don't have reducing electrons that they could do small molecule activation with. Um, but that means that they're easy to make these nice stable compounds. So here's uranium-4 doing an acid-base reaction with the four acidic protons of the phenol to kick out three equivalents of amine and make this uh, slot-shaped compound. So this is a letterbox-shaped compound with uranium or thorium here. Um, and this uh, two um, platforms here holding these two metals apart. Now, it's really important that we make these under base-free conditions. If we add donor solvents, then the metals move further apart, and we've published a range of other compounds, like cerium compounds, where we have six coordinate metals and they're THF solvated, and uh, we get salt incorporation in the middle, um, and those don't do, uh, those do nice redox chemistry, but not much, uh, they don't do any catalysis that we've been able to find just yet. Right? The other thing I've done is highlight these two hydrogens here, these reactive benzylic hydrogens that are going to be important. So this looks like distance. This is a, we look at the crystal structure. This is um, 6.6 6 .6 angstroms between these two uraniums, which is not dissimilar to uh, the gap that you might want to put a small molecule into. Um, the gap between the two arine planes here is four and a half angstroms as well. And we've got strong um, uranium oxygen bonds because this is uranium four oxidation state. But we also have a weak interaction suggested by these arenes because we're working in the absence of, of, of donor solvents. So this is all folded in. Um, so if we do a void calculation, we didn't do this. Steve Mogg actually did this for us. If we do a void calculation in the middle of this core, we can see that there's a, a reasonable volume in there that we might be able to get a small molecule into. Um, and if you look at the distance between the two metals, it's actually close to the covalent radii of uranium and nitrogen. So that comes out to 2.67 angstroms for these. And um, for what would be the uranium nitrogen distance? Um, um, and so if you add the, if you calculate the uranium N distances of what would be N2 end on bound in there, you'll get to 2.74. So it's reasonable that you might expect to be able to trap something, except as I've said, this is plus four oxidation state, so there shouldn't be any. But what happens is that because we have all of these arine interactions, uh, these arines around here, we can add a reductant like potassium graphite or even just potassium metal, turns out to be better in fact. And so these electrons can come in from an external reagent. And when we add electrons to this system, we pick up the N2 from the atmosphere um, and we trap it between the middle. And I can draw this complicated structure, thankfully, because we have this crystal structure here where you can see there are now, this is now a side on band N2. So our predictions weren't right, but we were not so bad. Um, what's happened is the uranium centers have come closer, find this N2 in a side on manner, which is um, allowing them presumably to get really good orbital overlap with that. Um, and this is now not an N2 bound, this is an N2 H2 2 minus. So you can see that it has the two nitrogens and it's picked up two protons here. And if you look at the crystal structure here, or you look at the chem draw, these nitrogens have presumably been reduced by the four potassiums somehow to become sufficiently nucleophilic that they can deprotonate that ligand. And then this forms a metal carbon bond and we make this functionalized N2 unit in the system. So this is the first time we've been able to isolate this more, this significantly reduced N2 unit and uh, make these now, what are now pseudo-pyramidal nitrogens uh, with an NN distance here of 1.49 angstroms that's longer than the single NN bond in hydrazine. So this is very well reduced. Um, 
and the potassiums are important here in the absence of donor solvents, they're forming these Aryan interactions and stabilizing the system, or maybe stabilizing the whole thing and allowing it to flex as the bond lengths change, as the electrons flow and the nitrogen gets reduced and is elongated. So we have long uranium carbon bonds in the system in comparison with hydrazine. So we're pretty happy with that. If we look at the N15 analogs, these are still strongly paramagnetic like the uranium-4. And so now we've gone from plus 4,000 in what we thought was a uranium-4 siloxide N2 compound to minus 4,000 uh, ppm in this compound. So we have no idea what that's signifying, but we're kind of interested in hardly anyone has been able to find nitrogen signals for uh, the 4F or the 5F compounds that we made. So we're hoping we'll be able to start looking at variants on this and learn a bit more. And we can also now see a significantly weakened NM in the realm, and then we can do the isotopomer calculation and see that that's okay. But what's more fun, I think, is that we can start looking at further functionalization. So we've got this N2 trapped, and now we can start to quench it. If we treat it with uh, a strong acid, pyridinium chloride, we get a release of free ligand, of course, and the metal compound, but we do make an ammonium chloride, which is, of course, uh, nitrogen which is um uh, nitrogen to ammonia formation but if we use a weak acid this is nice for us to see now we don't decompose this structure so we keep our metal oxygen bonds the metal is in the plus four oxidation so it's that stable and we release ammonia in this system and we can get around 60 percent yields in there it's not great but it's pretty good um, it's pleasing because this is the first time we've been able to get the ammonia out without just decomposing and digesting the whole uh, compound. This is the first for an ethyl. And then what's also nice is that, oh, sorry guys, um, because we've already protonated, we can now use the remaining equivalents to react with the silane and get an asymmetrically functionalized amine. So we can make silylamine and recapture our compound from starting material here. Of course, we're having to work in beta three conditions, and this molecule isn't very soluble, so that makes it difficult. But it's been it's been fun to do. So this is what we think the mechanism uh, is most uh, is happening. And Laurent Maron has done some great calculations for us, um, showing us the key points where the nitrogen is nucleophilic and deprotonating this uh, benzylic hydrogen here. And then the other interesting point is similar to uh, what Marinella was seeing in some of their chemistry. There is a chloride-assisted silylation with potassium, sorry, potassium-assisted silylation of the nitrogen happening in the next step that allows us to get through to these silylamines. And then the final point, this is what's uh, uh, new and giving us most fun and most uh, trials uh, as we try and understand the chemistry, is that we can now do a catalytic conversion for the first time of nitrogen to uh, secondary silylamine. I'm sorry, it looks like a transmutation. I've changed the color of the nitrogen. I couldn't see that uh, um, when I was doing that. I apologize for that. But here we have a smear of potassium across the inside of the vial. And then an excess of the weak acid that we know can reprotonate this ligand here without reprotonating and releasing our ligand. And then an excess, a larger excess of the silyl chloride. And because these reagents are not particularly uh, soluble and um, these are kinetically slow to react, they can all sit in the bottom of the flask and we can get this conversion of uh, up to 6.4. So this is a terrible catalytic reaction. And it's also a catalyst made of uranium um, or, or thorium, and we don't really want to do that. But what is nice is that we're getting a, an amine that we haven't been able to make cleanly and catalytically before with any metal in the toilet table. Um, and we're not, um, uh, we're not having to start from uranium-3. So we're starting from a robust system, and actually learning how to do a genuine catalytic turnover in this. There are huge amounts of things we still need to work out. But we're really having fun doing well we will be having fun doing it, it, it soon again especially as our density in our lab is allowed to increase to do more so uh, i wanted to finish by showing you um, the view from our new labs um, i hope you might come and visit us at some point when we're allowed to get on planes again from wherever country you're sitting watching unless of course you're just down the way uh, watching uh, from yeah from your bedrooms as well um, um, come and visit our labs uh, this is view looking towards uh, out across um, um, across the rest of uh, this is UC Berkeley campus down here uh, this is downtown um, this is the bay you can see Alcatraz 
and beyond it's the Golden Gate Bridge. But another really cool view is if you turn around and you look the opposite direction, you can see the advanced light source. So this is, um, this is a, a cool place where electron bunches travel at nearly at the speed of light in a circular path emitting ultraviolet and X-ray light. Um, so uh, uh, generating um, uh, light paths that can go into about 40 beam lines. And uh, we get access uh, through our friends and colleagues to um, one or two of those or even more of those beam lines so we can start to study our complexes. Maybe we can start to study the macrocycle polymers um, um, uh, using the soft x-rays that come out of this. Um, maybe we can start looking at trapping the N2 that we couldn't see in the actinide 4 compounds uh, using these. So um, if you want to come and, and uh, join us in looking at these studies, that would be really cool. Mm -hmm. So to finish up, I hope that um, you've enjoyed seeing how we're uh, using carbenes for different chemistry to what the late transition metal chemists would use them for, uh, using a bifunctional system of Lewis acid and, and NHC to make macrocycles that we're hoping give us some interesting properties that we can look at, and using not just uranium-3, but then simple actinide-4, more stable compounds to not just bind N2, but also convert it into secondary silylanes. So I'm really grateful to all these people in this difficult chemistry um, um, especially under particularly difficult circumstances now. Very grateful to the cal collaborators who've been doing really difficult calculations on actinide um, chemistry for us as well. Um, fantastic uh, support from the funding agencies, uh, both in Europe and now in the US, and um, to all of these people. So we have some people back in Edinburgh, and then we have some people now starting to do new explorations out behind the lab and uh, taking selfies. So I'm very grateful to all of them. And thank you for all of your attention. Thanks very much, Polly, for a really interesting talk. Um, you were well heard over the bin men, and I think the science <laughs> passed. Um, it's one one issue with the Zoom webinar software is that you can't get a round of applause from your from your attendees <laughs> because everyone's. Um, silent but I'm sure everyone is giving you a virtual round of applause for a very excellent talk. Um, there's a raised hand if you have a question can you put it in the Q&A um, please do start asking questions we've had a few. Um, Manoj I'm not sure what you've missed but you've asked uh, could you tell us how the nitrogen have five coordination Um, well, so you want me to do a Lewis structure of bonding to an actinide, yeah. Um, what we've done there is uh, draw all of the close contacts that come to the atoms in the crystal structure uh, in the same way as that we would draw uh, agostic and close contact interactions to hydrocarbons and CH uh, groups. So uh, this is the organometallic way of saying there are close contacts everywhere, and we don't yet know exactly where every two electron pair is. But we do actually have some rather nice natural bond order calculations for uh, Laurent Maron. So what we would just need to do is go back and hopefully do some more calculations there and look into those so we can see exactly where the electrons are spread out to. Hope that answers your question, Manoj. Ollie would like to ask, are there any environmental radiation concerns with using actinide for catalysis? Uh, yes, of course there are. Um, in the olden days, there were um, quite a few industrial processes that used uranium oxides for heterogeneous catalysis. They're really good uh, at redox catalysis. Um, and in fact, um, uh, an industrial company who will remain nameless told me that they also had some catalysts that made some of the best um, natural rubber, um, uh, catalysis for making natural rubber out of them. But people don't want to use them anymore, understandably. They don't want actinides in their backyards. Um, to be fair, um, there is plenty of uranium dissolved in seawater already. So we're constantly in contact with background radioactivity. The reason that we make these studies is because they constantly challenge us to think about the D block differently. Um, so we made some arine functionalizations using uranium that 
um, haven't been seen for the D-block. And it challenged us to go back and look at palladium chemistry and see if we could develop a catalytic correlation from that. Um, and it, every time we find this reactivity, it teaches us more about the fundamentals as well. If you wanted to make, uh, to develop an industrial catalytic process from them, then you would actually need to consider um, the chemical toxicity of the actinides more than you would need to consider the radio toxicity because if there are um, power stations using uranium and making uranium waste everywhere and if you think about how much uranium is being used in counterweights in airplanes for example um, then it's already all around us but you would need to protect the workers from the radio toxicity and you would need to make sure it's nowhere near in your product so you wouldn't you wouldn't want to make a bio compatible material absolutely in the same way as you wouldn't make one from palladium thank you um bolan would like to know how much of the cerium catalyst will be left in the lactide polymer and will the catalyst be recoverable so when we're working at five thousand to one equivalents um you you can't even see any color and so the cerium three is yellow anyway but when it gets oxidized up in air it goes to a beautiful purple color actually um so you would see that but you can't see that in the polymer um, because there's so little um it's the thing I like about the macrocycle formation is in fact that it's not an initiator and it really is a genuine catalyst. So we've never tried to recover it because we're using such tiny loadings, but it would be fun to recover it. But one thing that we can do is add a lot of monomer, uh, make the polymer and then wait, and then just add more, uh, more monomer in and see that going. But we haven't tried that. Um, anything further to isolate the compound. Thank you. Um, Grace says, uh, thanks for an amazing talk and some, uh, sorry, a great talk of amazing chemistry. Um, and would like to ask, in the uranium chemistry, the uraniums are bound by hydrazide. Where did the last two electrons for breaking, bre breaking the NN single bond come from? The triaryl methanide, question mark. Yeah, good, good, good question. No, they come from the extra potassium. So we have to have extra potassium in there to give those uh, equivalents. We don't get it out unless there is potassium sitting there. Okay. And um, Dr. Para Rodriguez from Birmingham would like to thank you for a talk and say, have you considered immobilizing the complex in a surface and control the redox process electrochemically? Yeah. I would love to do that chemistry, electrochemically. Um, we would need to, we've, we've looked, we know that it's compatible with the ammonium salts, um, but if we add donor solvents, like you would need to use for an electrolyte, then the tight catalyst structure springs open and, and the metals stick out the other side. So we lose catalytic activity. Um, we have another system that Lars is working on, um, where we're seeing reactivity that works in donor salts. So I don't think these ones would be the right ones to do um, electrochemical catalysis, unless someone can tell me some really clever stuff about microelectrodes and we can work in toluene, which would be cool. Um, I think our best bet is actually to go into our second generation systems and start to work in donor salts. So yes, that's something we really love to do. Yeah, good question. Thanks. Opportunity for collaboration there. <laughs> Um, and an anonymous attendee, um, I'm not sure if this is the question they don't want to admit to, but um, in the nitrogen <laughs> reduction, the N2 reduction catalysis, have you tested for heterogeneous catalysis with the uranium nanoparticles, for example, by using a mercury amalgam tests or other poisoning experiments? No, we haven't. Because we could see the functionalisation, the different functionalisation, we assumed that that couldn't, given that no other catalyst has managed to, to make, um, to cleanly make a secondary silylamine, we assumed that it had to be showing that we had control from the metal and the, um, and the ligand in combination. But yes, I, I know what he's talking about. And I know there are some really simple iron salts, like iron core and things that can just make trisylylamine with it. So yeah, and there's another reason, like why would you bother? But I, 
my feeling was that I, I shouldn't say my feeling too. That's not very scientific. But my yeah, my my instincts were that because we had control over the product formation, that, that couldn't come from a heterogeneous system. That's a good point about just the ammonia synthesis. We should also check that. Or we should carry on and try and make other secondary things as well, which we know. Um, are there any more questions for Polly? Well, we've come to the, the end of the questions that have been submitted so far, apart from a few um, saying thank you very much. Um, we've got nothing more coming in, so you obviously explained everything really clearly. Um, in that case, I think we will draw the webinar to a close. Um, just to um, say that um, our next webinar is um, on the 29th of July at three o'clock with Nick Turner and Anthony Green on the design, engineering and application of biocatalysts in organic synthesis. I shared the Eventbrite link at the beginning of the chat on the chat rather than Q&A, so you'll have to scroll back. Um, and I shared the, the screen at the beginning of the lecture. Obviously, all the details are on the Catalysis Hub website and we will share it on social media over the next month. Um, uh, I hope again, Polly will feel the virtual round of applause and, and, and thank you very much for joining us, especially early in the morning from America. It's been a great honor to have you speaking at this webinar. Um, I would- Feel a bit awkward now. Do I just everybody else? <laughs> There's no kind of clear ending, but I am going to shut the webinar down. Um, it will go. The recording will go on our website um, as soon as Zoom has processed it, which takes a little while. But we'll try and get it up by the end of the week at least. Um, so thank you for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you next month, or not seeing you all next month, but being in your presence next month. Cool. Thanks very much. Bye. Right.